Hey everybody, it's CVH here with another Top 10 Crafting Guide video for The Elder Scrolls Legends, and today we're going to be talking about epics. If you haven't seen my video on the Top 10 Legendaries to craft, uh, I strongly encourage you to check it out. I posted it yesterday. Uh, these are two videos, the Legendary and Epic videos that I am redoing from about six months ago when I first recorded them. As I mentioned in the previous video, uh, I just realized the meta had changed a lot, some monthly cards and meta trends had come and gone, so uh, I should probably do an update since the game just launched officially on PC with the iPad and mobile releases soon coming after. Uh, so uh, just to give all the new players uh, an impression of maybe some cards they should look at getting their hands on if they're new to the game or if they're just building the collection for the first time. But as I mentioned, a lot of this is going to come down to your own personal journey collecting cards, which decks you particularly want to build, uh, whether or not you're into control, aggro, mid-range. Uh, this is basically just my top 10 list of safe to craft cards, as I did with the legendaries I'll be doing with the epics today. Uh, epics that I believe you would benefit from getting your hands on uh, just because they're uh, pretty versatile, can be used in a variety of decks, and should retain their power level long term. Uh, some of these will be used in less decks than others, of course, but I'll get into more of those specifically as we go up the list, starting with number 10. So for number 10 we have Thorn Hist Mage, and I mentioned this in the Legendary video that I try to stay away from these class specific cards in these videos, uh, for example Thorn Hist Mage being of the agility and endurance uh, attributes can only be used in scout decks, I try to stay away from them because my goal is to give you guys a list of cards that you can craft and use in a variety of decks, and Thorn Hist Mage, like Hiking Emmerich from yesterday's Legendary video, can only be used in decks of one specific class that being Scout. Uh, however, I am using Thornhist Mage as number 10 because I kind of want to touch on the fact that a lot of these class cards are very, very powerful. Uh, Thornhist Mage I'm choosing to include over the other ones simply because I have not seen a Scout deck ever that did not want to play Thornhist Mage. Uh, there aren't really any hyper-aggressive Scout decks that would not want to play the card, and in any sort of mid-range or ramp sort of control strategy, Thornhist Mage is just fantastic. A 5-drop 2-5 with Guard, which automatically becomes a 3-5 because it's going to gain an attack power when it when the max magicka increases off of the summon effect of gaining the plus one max magicka like tree minder so this is everything tree minder wants to be for a little bit later in the curve as well as a big body that's going to be able to trade with a lot of things or pressure effectively while having guard to be really that super important tool against aggressive strategies. So I shouldn't really need to talk too much about the value of this card. Clearly it's very good, and I believe you should definitely try to get your hands on a playset if you're interested in playing Scout at all. But the reason I have this at number 10 as well is because I'd like to talk about the other uh, class-specific cards for a minute, because a lot of them are incredibly powerful as well. In addition to Hist Mage, um, some similarities are uh, Sentinel Battle Mace and Rift Thane are two cards that I haven't really seen ever. Uh, not in a deck of their class, Battle Mace used in almost every Battle Mage deck, Rift Thane used in almost every Crusader deck. Uh, depending on the type of deck you're playing, a lot of these, like Master of Thieves, Shornhelm Champion, Sadrus Agent, etc., can be used in these decks as well. Edict of Azure is another one of those that is rarely seen not in a control spell sword, or I've never really seen not in a spell sword deck, usually in every single spell sword deck. If you're going to try to like build into a certain class for starters, getting your hands on these would be pretty safe. I try not to include too many of them on the list, I'm just including Hiss Mage as an example because I believe its power level is maybe overall the highest, but if you're going to be playing a certain class's deck, uh, I suggest you at least look at the class specific cards available to you. Uh, Hist Mage by itself, if I were simply rating these epics on this list by only power level, it would be way higher than number 10, but uh, due to the fact that unlike the other cards on this list, it can only be played in one specific class's decks, uh, that's why we have it at number 10 here. Leaf Lurker comes in at number 9, there isn't a whole lot to say about this card that hasn't already been said, it's pretty simple, a finish off on a stick, a 5 drop 4-3 agility creature, which with summon, the finish off effect destroy a wounded enemy creature. So this card is seen a lot in um, many mid-range decks, mid-range scout, mid-range archer, ramp scout makes use of this card, a lot of control decks that use agility, any sort of control monk decks that might pop up, uh, the only types of decks this isn't really used in. Uh, too much are super aggressive decks using agility, and uh, sometimes late game decks like Ramp Scout will use Finish Off instead or Territorial Viper depending on the type of removal they think is necessary for the time, but Leaf Lurker overall is an incredibly solid card, a little bit slow occasionally and obviously it requires a certain you know amount of types of ping damage to, to get the maximum effect out of it, which is a lot of the reason Archer loves this card so much because of the access to Rapid Shot and Sharpshooter Scout or Skaven Pyromancer, all these kind of different things that can deal some damage. Uh, but yeah, Leaf Lurker overall, an incredibly solid card. If you're looking to build into agility, it wouldn't hurt to pick up some Leaf Lurkers. 
Pillaging Tribune comes in at number 8 on this list, and this is a card that did in fact see a nerf. It used to be Summon, uh, give drain to every creature in the lane that you're summoning Pillaging Tribune. Now it is a 5 drop, 5, 4 still, with Summon, give a friendly creature drain this turn. So people thought this nerf would be actually uh, pretty huge to the card, and as a matter of fact, it's still incredibly playable in a lot of the control decks and uh, sort of later game oriented mid-range decks that would play it in the first place. Uh, still basically a guaranteed 3 of in any control mage or control spell sword list you'll be playing against, so for those of you out there trying to rush your control opponents down, I recommend playing around all three copies if it's available to be doing so. Uh, Pillaging Tribune, however, has remained in instant inclusion in all those decks, and it added some versatility actually with the nerf because no longer are you limited to the lane you have to play Pillaging Tribune And For example, if you want to give your Odiving Drain and it's in the field lane, but you want to put Pillaging Tribune in the shadow lane because you don't want it to be attacked, that option is available to you. You can still give the Odiving Drain, uh, which adds a little bit of versatility. Obviously, the drain effect has been nerfed somewhat. You never really get as overall as much drain as you might have done before, except if you only had one other creature on the board, period. Uh, so that part has been nerfed, but it's still one of, if not the most powerful healing effects in the game. Uh, in any sort of control deck, you're playing cards like Manticore, you're playing cards like Odiving, like I mentioned, uh, these big beefy threats that you're going to be closing out the game with, uh, and they don't really help you stabilize too much. They might have good stabilization effects on board, removing things but you still run the risk of getting burned out by cards like Lightning Bolt and Charge cards like Cliff Racer if you don't find that heal, and Pillaging Tribune allows you to do that in a package that it's actually not necessarily bad by itself. Even against other control decks, a card like Healing Potion might be dead because it's really a one-trick pony, it's just gonna heal. Pillaging Tribune actually provides a substantial body as well, which makes this card super well-rounded, and I definitely encourage you to pick any as many copies of these up as possible, up to three obviously, if you're gonna play any sort of late-game deck. Number 7 is another card that allows us to gain life, Moonlight Werebat. Now this card also, like Pillaging Tribune, did see a nerf, it used to be a 4-3, and at that point it was one of the craziest cards and the easily the scariest Prophecy card in the entire game. Uh, as it turns out, reducing a card's health by 1 can be a pretty big nerf when that nerf is from 3 to 2. Moonlight Werebat now um, still sees a lot of play, which is why obviously it's on this list. If you're looking for a solid prophecy, if you're building into agility, uh, there isn't really an agility deck that suffers for having Moonlight Werebat. Some choose not to include it, this is more of a meta call now than it was before, whereas before it was so incredibly bonkers that it was just in every single deck using green, and that was one of the reasons green was far and away the best, uh, best attribute in the game. But now at a 4-2 it's a more reasonable card. For those of us who remember the old Werebat, uh, it might be a little weak compared to the old Werebat, but it's still very powerful if you're going to be playing any sort of these aggressive uh, Prophecy Assassin decks, which has sort of fell, fallen out of favor. But it really also helps you in those late-game decks as well. Like I mentioned, Control control Monk, uh, Ramp Scout. These are decks that are frequently looking for more drain, frequently looking for good Prophecies to turn the tides against aggro when they might have had a slower start against the aggressive decks. And Moonlight Werebat um, definitely is one of the top cards to consider when you're trying to build those kinds of decks. So I definitely think you should probably consider getting your hands on these if you're interested in playing decks with agility. Uh, like I said, sort of a meta call. Sometimes it's in favor, sometimes it's not. You really have to make that call yourself. The Abundance of Sorcerers both makes this card good in that if they break your runes early, you can pop out a Werebat and start turning the tides but a little fragile as well since it dies to Daggerfall Mage, Windkeep Spell Sword, and Firebolt. So like I said, a meta, call a meta call card, but very, very powerful, and I expect it to see play for a long time, so should retain its value. Moving on to strength for number 6, we have Markarth Bannerman, and Bannerman is actually a card that saw a pretty huge rise in popularity after I did the last top 10 epics to craft video, so I'm glad I can sort of give Markarth Bannerman its time to shine on this list. Um, it's a definitely an incredibly powerful card, the, the main weakness to this card is that sometimes it gets silenced, sometimes it gets lightning bolted, but Markarth Bannerman is an important part of any deck that uses these sort of token strategies because it generates the two Nord Firebrand tokens, which are the charge zero cost one ones that are, you know, you see the card itself, it actually exists in the game, but this card gives you Nord Firebrands, which you can add to your hand, along with cards like Raiding Party, which also gives you Nord Firebrand. And uh, a lot of aggro decks use this sort of strategy to then buff the tokens, the Nord Firebrands, up with cards like Orc Clan, Captain, or Northwood Outpost. Uh, but typically, the main reason this card is so good is because of the Merrick Battle Mage deck, uh, which uses the tokens in combination with Merrick to flood the lane and then give everything, every all the charge tokens an item, or play Supreme Atromancer, ping for the four damage that we talked about in the Legendary video, and then summon these Nord Firebrands one after the other, continue getting that two damage a piece in from the Atromancer in addition to the Nord Firebrands one damage a piece itself, or you could just trade with them and you're still doing the ping damage with the Atromancer. So Markarth Bannerman, incredibly powerful in Merrick, incredibly powerful 
in any of these token aggro strategies, and even a fine uh, five drop to fill out your curve if you're playing some sort of mid range deck that just needs one. Uh, very good card, one of the best five drops in the game easily, and a card that I think we'll see play for a long time. Fortunately, we'll probably always also see Lightning Bolt and cards like Shadow and Priest and Earthbone Spinner to deal with this card as well for a long time. At number 5, we have our first Endurance card, Preserver of the Root. Now, this is just a solid creature through and through. A 4 drop, 4-4, four, four, which becomes a 6-6 six, six with guard if you have 7 or more max magicka. So, obviously, a 4 drop, 6-6 six, six is absolutely crazy, and a 4 drop, 4-4 four, four is... Uh, while not spectacular, it's at least reasonable to play. You can play it down early, and then it'll get buffed when you finally reach 7 or, seven or more max magicka on the board. Uh, a lot of times that is what's, what happens because you're forced to play this card a little bit early against more aggressive decks. Uh, but even if you're playing a, a more aggressive mid-range strategy yourself, you can plop it down, punch for 4 damage, and if your opponent doesn't immediately get, answer, uh, get an answer to it in the first couple turns of it being on the board, all of a sudden it's even larger, a 6-6 with guard, and is going to punch for that much more. So it's pretty versatile in the fact that it can be used in those mid-range decks and those slower control decks, like Control Spell Sword and Ram Scout. Pretty rare to see a slower deck using Endurance without three of these. Some mid-range decks choose not to play it. Uh, uh, but it is very, very common, and for good reason. It's just a very simple, very solid creature uh, with a lot of utility against both slower decks as a beat stick and against faster decks as that big, easy-to-play guard. Uh, once you reach those later turns in those slower decks, you can start using Preserver of the Root as an easy 6-6 guard while weaving in a bunch of other things to your turn to make use of all those cards in your hand. Very easy to play, very effective on the board. We have another 4 cost card at number 4 on our list, although it's a pretty different card, we move back to strength for Earthbone Spinner. Now this is one of the best silence effects in the game, and we'll be talking about another good silence effect later on the list, but Earthbone Spinner is a 4 cost 3-2 with summon, silence another creature, and then deal 1 damage to it. So this is, besides being the absolute perfect answer to cards like Descendant of Alkosh and Gardener of Swords, which start at 1 HP, but then could potentially grow, get keywords or items attached to them, and require pretty immediate answers or they threaten to take over the game, besides that, it's just a very moderately costed silence effect, and silence is a rarity. Uh, so in strength, we're having a card here that doesn't really require you to have other things on the board. Uh, Bone Bow, for example, is a pretty, you know, moderately costed silence as well, but it's an item, so it requires you to have board presence. This card does not require any sort of such thing. So it's good for aggressive decks because it's low enough cost to where you can play it pretty easily. It's good for slower decks just because of its utility. Silence is just a really important effect, whether or not you're dealing with like a powerful effect like the Alkosh, like I mentioned, a Blood Magic Lord or Mark Hearth Bannerman that threatened to attack on the following turn and just outvalue you in the late game, or you're even silencing your own thing to attack and push, or you're silencing something in the cover lane to attack over it. Silence is just really, really important. And this being one of the best ways to silence anything in the game means it's pretty much a uh, staple in any sort of strength deck. Definitely encourage you to pick these cards up if you're planning on playing a deck with strength, uh, whether it be aggro, midrange, or control. Now, it's only right that we give actions some love on this list as well, so here we have Ice Storm at number 3, and it's not just included because it's an action, obviously, it's included in this list because it's an incredibly, incredibly powerful card that I did mention as well in the last Top 10 Epic video as with a few of these. But Ice Storm, I mentioned actually that it doesn't always see play as a 3 of in some of these control decks that would play it like Control Mage. Uh, as it turns out, uh, potentially due to the meta shifts, potentially due to people optimizing the list more, potentially even due to Supreme Atromancer's, uh prominence on the ladder. Ice Storm is basically just a snap three of in any sort of slower deck using uh, intelligence, whether it be Merrick Battle Major, Control Major, any sort of other thing. It's also sometimes included as a tech choice in more aggressive decks like Midrange or Item Sorcerer, because it sort of functions as a reset button. You're getting aggressive, but maybe your opponent's stabilizing or taking over the board, and Ice Storm can sort of clear their assault and allow you to get that final push in with one or two bigger beat sticks that wouldn't die to the Ice Storm. So Ice Storm, really simple card, just dealing 3 damage to all creatures. It's the most important tool uh, for a lot of those slower decks to just deal with aggro, because yeah, you can stabilize with your guards and stuff later and heal and all that, which you're going to need to do, but first and foremost, you need to remove the incoming pressure on the board, and Ice Storm is just the most efficient way to do that. Not a whole lot to say about that, but if you're planning on playing any deck that goes later than the first 4 or so turns with intelligence in it, you'll probably want to pick up a playset of Ice Storms. At number 2, we have another one of these cards that's used in a lot of late game decks like Ice Storm, but we're moving to Willpower with Manticora. Now, Manticora is basically the epitome of control, uh, and as a result, it's used as a 3 of in virtually every control deck you'll see. Uh, this card has been seeing play for a long, long time. Used to be absolutely insane in that it could destroy an enemy creature in either lane. It has been limited somewhat by the fact that you now have to play it in the same lane as whatever creature you want to destroy, but it's still a fantastic card. Uh, as with Ice Storm, like I said, if you're playing a late game deck with Intelligence, you want three Ice Storms. If you're playing a late game deck with Willpower, you definitely want three Mana Koras. The reason is targeted removal is basically the backbone of a control deck. You want to have a way to destroy opposing threats. That's sort of the idea behind control. 
Manticore gives you that, which is valuable across the board against all matchups. In addition, you're getting a 6-6 body that can pressure, and it has guard, which means, especially if you're playing something in, uh, if you're playing it in the shadow lane to kill something in the shadow lane, you're then guarding against incoming pressure, especially in the shadow lane. It's very important because you can't attack those creatures immediately. So it's giving you a guard, it's giving you a removal, it's giving you a body, it's everything you want. Uh, 10 seems like a lot, but it's basically the 10 drop to play in all these control decks. Uh, very important card, definitely recommend you picking up a playset of these. At number one, we have none other than Shadowfin Priest, which is actually the last card I did a card analysis video on. So I'm not going to talk too much about this card. It does an awful lot. I went in a little bit more in depth in the card analysis video if you guys want to check that out. But to summarize, 5 drop 4 4 with summon, silence another creature, or destroy an enemy support. This is one of the highest utility cards in Elder Scrolls Legends. And as a result, completely a staple in Endurance decks. Very rare to not see this card. Uh, sometimes if you're playing a Warrior deck and you want a Silence but a more reasonably cost Silence because you're already playing a lot of 5 drops, like my mid-range Warrior deck played Earthbone Spinner instead of Shadow and Priest, but a lot of the decks that want a Silence will just play Shadow and Priest because I believe it is the best Silence in the game. Uh, due to its body, first of all, it dies to a lot less than Earthbone Spinner does, and the fact that destroying the enemy support is huge. It's important to have that kind of support interaction when you're up against cards like Mundestone, Wabajack, Altar of Despair, uh, crazier things like Orb of Vermin and Heroic Rebirth, which can easily get out of hand, any Northwind Outposts and Divine Fervors and Aggressive Decks, Rothgar, Forge, the list goes on and on. Uh, support cards can be very scary and they're kind of hard to interact with sometimes, so a card like Shadow and Priest, which is already going to be very good in your deck due to its pretty reasonable body and great silence effect obviously on summon uh, gets even better in that it can deal with those sort of you know crazy support cards that might get one over on you if you just happen to be playing a deck that will otherwise not have support removal uh, so I talked about this card maybe even being a little too good I wouldn't be surprised to see the health nerfed on this card in the future but uh, even if that is done to the card I think this card is going to see free see play for a long long time uh, definitely a staple in any just about any endurance deck so that's about it for the top 10 list uh, I went over some honorable mentions in the legendary video I'm not going to do so here just because there are so many playable epics and so many epics to go through compared to legendaries I did talk about some of the class specific ones when I was talking about uh, Thorn Hist Mage at number 10 and yeah those are a lot of examples of some that are almost made the cut a lot of very very powerful legendaries for aggro mid-range and control a lot of the epics sort of fit into one style but not the other two I tried to include a good amount of cards in this list that can see play in aggro, mid-range control, tempo, combo, is very, you know, like Earthbone Spinner, like a very standard, good legendary across the board. Uh, but there are definitely a ton of playable epics out there. Uh, feel free to like the video if you've enjoyed, if it's helped you out at all. Feel free to comment if I've missed anything you think, or if I've overrated some, undervalued some. Add to the conversation, I greatly appreciate it. Feel free to subscribe to the channel for more strategy content, guides, deck techs, stream highlights, etc. I'll also link my stream link down below. Feel free to drop a follow for Daily Legend streams. Hopefully this video helped you out crafting cards in Elder Scrolls Legends, and I will see you guys next time.